So um, most industries miss the biggest threat that is about to hit them because it's not coming from other competitors in their field, but from a completely set of disruptive technologies. When you look at Kodak, the, emer the emergence of digital film hit them like a, a ball hitting you right on the side of the head, UBS stick being the, the sort of new Kodak film. The car industry is being hit by this device. If you actually look at the three big changes that are happening right now in the car industry, they're all happening as a result of the mobile phone. In, inside the phone, there's a, a battery that was designed to carry hours and hours of hours of useless selfies and what's up and so forth. But it's designed in order to get, give us the power to sort of mo move around with our computing device in our pocket. Those batteries were not designed for electric cars, but if you string them together, as Tesla showed, you could actually power an electric car in not just good enough fashion, but better than a normal ICE car does. If you look at the selfie camera on both sides of the phone, the improvement in resolution, continuous improvement in resolution, has actually generated the ability to discern what's happening on the road in front of us. If you put enough cameras around the car, you're able to understand what's going on around the car better than an 18-year-old kid with WhatsApp driving the car. And so the combination of better cameras plus lighter technology gives us the ability to actually do autonomous driving. And finally, the integrated environment in which we all carry a supercomputer that's always connected at all times enables companies like Uber, Get Taxi, Lyft, and others to actually have a system where everybody knows where every car is at any point in time and can ask for a car on demand and it just shows up. So take these three disruptive changes that are happening, all at speeds that the car industry has never seen. And when I talk about speeds, I want to illustrate it for a second. The, the shift in New York and London from the yellow cab or black cab to Uber the transition has happened in the span of about 18 months. In both cities, Uber went from 2,000 drivers to 20,000 drivers, the same number as taxis, within 18 months. It's actually surpassed now in both New York and London about 2x more Uber drivers than taxi drivers. And at the same time, data shows us that the tr transition has happened so fast because it didn't shift, unlike Get Taxi, which shifted the model for taxi drivers, most Uber rides are actually taking place in, instead of being the driver in your own car. And how do we know that? Data in New York actually illustrates two things. During that time in which Uber went 10x up, taxi drivers took the same amount of money home every day. So it, we did not replace, Uber did not replace taxis. And at the same time, Speed on the street, the average speed, remained the same, with the exception of areas in New York where bike lanes were added. And so it did not replace public transportation. It wasn't instead of the subway. What it did replace is the following thought. To own a, a, a car in London, in New York, costs about $10,000 a year. Why? Because you need to park it, you need to pay insurance, you need to own the car itself, you need to maintain it, $10,000 a year. So the thought in your head is $10,000 a year or a coupon book with 1,000 Uber rides. And every time you use one of those rides, you pay 10 bucks. 1,000 rides, a car. And the better thought is 1,000 rides while drinking, <laughs> car. That sort of shifted the scale. And so what happened, there's a massive shift, and that shift is unprecedented in the car industry. When we talk about adoption technology in the car industry, more car executives would tell you the shift would take a very long time. This is a shift from one, car ownership, to zero, no car. And it happened in the span of a couple of years. For an industry where introduction of hybrids 15, 20, 30 years. So the thought process was something that hit the car industry very hard out of nowhere.
Now, if you put the three together, what do you get? You actually get a very interesting outcome. If I can press a button and an autonomous thing, let's not call it a car for a second, an autonomous moving thing shows up within a minute, two, five, but it shows up predictably. And it takes me from here to there. The average ride in New York, roughly about 10 minutes. From here to there. At a cost, which we'll discuss in a second, that is affordable. Let's say affordable, for the sake of definition, is the same cost as a bus or a subway. So if I can press the button and a thing comes up and takes me there and drops me there, and then I can take it again and go back for the cost of a bus, who in this room would want to own a car? Why would you do that? And the answer is, by most people in the car industry, is because we love driving cars. And it's true. Some of us do love driving cars. In the previous transition that this industry had seen, about 100 years ago, people said the same thing. People relate to their horses. We love riding horses. But if you see what happened in the industry, horses did not get eliminated. They were sent to a farm outside of the city where you could ride and enjoy it. Riding a horse in the middle of the city is not fun, <laughs> as is driving a car. So the transition would generate a shift. Mobility as a service, mobility for utility purposes, a service offered with autonomous things moving around, moving on electrons, not on gasoline. And the reason is very simple. If a service off is offered that way, who owns the car? A fleet, not a person. If a fleet owns the car, how much time would the car drive every day? 24 hours. Why? Capitalism. If a car drives 24 hours a day, what is the energy used to drive it? Electrons. Why? Cheaper. No environmentalism, no clean air, just capitalism. Driving a car for 24 hours a day for a year costs more than the car in gasoline. And so the replacement of gasoline would happen into electrons by virtue of the fact that it just makes sense economically. So let's put it all together for a second. You have a car, drives on electrons, moves from point A to point B, and goes all day every day. How many rides does it make? We know from New York, the average taxi goes 24 hours a day, does about 100 rides every day. A year, 30,000 rides. Let's say that car lives for about five years, because we may actually know how to drive it longer on the outside, but the inside would get ruined, especially in Tel Aviv, five years. 150,000 rides. The car itself, plus the battery, we know the GM Bolt is about $35,000. And the cost of the autonomous thing, cameras, software, you name it, is an argument. Tesla says it's about $10,000. Mobileye says it's about $1,000. Let's agree that it's somewhere in between, about $5,000 and getting cheaper. $40,000 for the whole thing, 150,000 rides in five years, cost, 25 cents per ride. When you can offer an autonomous service, 25 cents per ride, magic happens. You know what that magic is? The government can tax it. <laughs> and when the government can tax it, it happens. And when they can tax it and still make it cheaper than a bus, and cheaper than a subway, it will happen faster than having a subway in Tel Aviv. <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> now, what is the implication of that? Lots of implications. First thing, question of timing. How fast does it happen? It happens faster than all the other transitions, mainly because you're now offering an economic incentive for all participants in this ecosystem to transition over to this new modality. You also offer a massive new incentive that the car industry has never seen before. 
The car industry is always accounted for long development time because at the end of the day, they have to wrap us inside a box that can sustain a crash in a theoretical speed of about 35 miles per hour. As McNamara said when he was still at Ford, we have to wrap the eggs better so that if you drop the box, some of the eggs will survive. And the industry remained in that same fashion, missing the one realization, the eggs actually operate this machine and 93% of car accidents are caused by the eggs. But because you can't design the egg out, we can't design the kid with 18 years old, one year of driving and three phones and four friends in the back, you can't design them out of the car, we sort of accepted that 93% of car accidents will happen as a result of people. But if you can take that out, design that factor out, magic happens. 93% of accidents will not happen. Which is the reason why we've seen a bug in the autonomous driving software, when Tesla's autonomous driver misunderstood the fact that a truck in the middle of the road is not a bridge far in the distance and drove right into it. And the car watching Harry Potter saw a man being sliced in half. It was just him. But the government did a very interesting assessment. They came back and said, if we can save 93% of 35,000 deaths a year, we understand that in the process we will have some mishaps. We take a perspective of the overall interest of society over the interest of one incident and did not stop experimenting. Put guidelines in place, 15 different interesting guidelines in place, but at the end of the day said, no, keep going because it's important for us that you stop car accidents. And that was something the car industry did not understand when it assessed originally that the first accident would stop this wave. It will not stop. So the speed is very, very fast. The adoption is extremely fast. And the only thing that remains to understand how we think about it is at the end of the day, somebody will have statistics that show that the hardware and the software in this device put around the car is better than an average driver, in which case insurance companies will come up and say, I will insure your software. I will insure it on a cost on a per mile basis, and the insurance will be pre-bundled into the car. And at the end of the day, Nobody needs to assume the risk of algorithms, but you have to improve them. And when that happens, there's no stopping of this shift. It will happen faster than most people think. How much faster? It doesn't really matter. Because we're now arguing whether Ford saying 2021 is the year when they'll be ready with massive fleets, or GM 2019, or Tesla 2018, it doesn't really matter. Why? If you start today a new design for a new car in any car company, do you know how long you need to assume that the car will continue to be selling for you to start the program? In order for you to start the program today, the program takes four years until it reaches market, and for it to be profitable, it needs to be selling for at least six more years after that. So to start a car program today, you have to assess that the market will not change in the next 10 years. Which side do you want to take the bet on? For or against change? Massive implications. If the shift happens, if it happens in the next five years or 10 years, doesn't really matter, somewhere between five and 10 years, it changes everything we know about multiple different segments, cars, the operations of cars, the design of a city, the oil industry, everything that moves around it. It also probably ends some professions that we're used to. Some of them are very long industries. How many of you love to go to your garage to get your car fixed? You won't. How many of you love to go into a gas station and argue with the attendant that the price has moved up? You won't. But also, Uber drivers will disappear. Probably the shortest industry to ever exist other than the head of fax operations in banks, other than Israeli banks. 
So you'll see a massive shift. It has to happen and probably will happen very soon. The question, given, given that we're about out of time, what is the role of government in this change? So government needs to, to sort of take a first question, a high level question. Do we want to run ahead or behind this curve? Massive question. Massive question. Do we want to run ahead or behind this curve? Some countries decided to go ahead and move ahead of the curve. You're seeing cars running around the US, the UK. They're actually allowing companies to build knowledge, experience, data around real operations with people, with software, building industries. We have one of the key companies in this field, Mobileye. Israel should be ahead of the curve. It is not. Two, is this a national program or a regional program? Today, mobility as a service is a very regionalized operation. You see operations that are happening at a city level. And in an interesting way, this actually makes sense. If you think about taxis, they drive in islands. Most taxis drive in islands. The island is the region in which they operate. And so regionalizing it is a very interesting proposition. You're seeing Uber doing experiments in Pittsburgh. You're seeing a lot of experiments that are being done at a city level. And if you think about it, the one key asset for mobility as a service are the roads, which are effectively owned by the city. So the question, who owns the service and who taxes the service, is a massive question. Is this going to be taxed by Tel Aviv, or is this going to be taxed by the Israeli government? And when it's taxed, who defines the rules? And what's the structure of the industry? If you think of the car industry today, makers, lots of car makers, if you think of what you see today when you use mobility as a service, you have Get Taxi, Uber, and others who are offering you the service, the back seat. But if you think of a mobility as a service in an autonomous world, that structure is kind of messy. Who owns the car? Who drives the car? Who cleans the car? Who operates this whole thing? Who owns the energy? All these questions are still remaining fairly open right now. What, we're, what we're seeing right now are some projects that are done top to bottom. Singapore is an example. The government is the integrator, offering end-to-end -end stack from the car, the operation, the application itself. We're seeing places where the seat vendor, the ride vendor, Uber, is managing the process top to bottom up until the car. They're plugging their software, their autonomous service on top of a car that they source from Ford. And we're seeing some like Tesla, which are basically saying, we're going to offer it top to bottom ourselves. So lots of vertical integration. But if you look at it eventually, there's no reason why this industry will not behave exactly like flights, the airline industry. Think about it. When you go on an airplane, there's a maker, Boeing, Airbus, about 10 others. There's an operator, an airline. But you probably bought your ticket on Expedia or at the local travel agent in a bundle with a hotel room and lots of other things. So if you think of this structure, the three-tier structure, eventually the industry will get there. But today, we don't have an operator. There's no ground line. Nobody operates a ground line, for lack of a better name. There will be. All these things, all these questions and implications, they're all massive. They're creating industries. They're destroying industries. They'll be taxed. There'll be lots of profits to make, lots of bets to place. Because at the end of the day, think about it, the aggregation of the car industry, the services to cars, the energy to cars, namely fuels oil, combined, one of the largest industries in the world. And if you take the combination of these multi-trillion dollar businesses, which account for about a sixth of the world's manufacturing, which account for a third of the world's energy, and you say they're going to shift in the next decade over their heads, and there's nothing that can be done to stop it. You have to choose 
whether you're about to buy a car, whether you're about to invest in a company, or whether you're a government, you have to choose whether you're going to go ahead or be carried in crying and screaming, but you're going to get there faster than you think. Thank you very much.